It started as two neighbors having drinks and ended in tragedy. Back in the day when you were younger, if you were in an altercation with somebody, you hit each other. That was it. It was just after 11 o'clock on Saturday night when police were called to this home in the Calgary community of Auburn Bay. There's a guy stabbed multiple times by me. Oh, my God. I stabbed him everywhere. <laughs> Broke two knives off and a big butcher knife he bit like a banana. What person would do such a thing? It's it's like just a, every, everything changed. Mood, you know. I was I was drunk having fun and then all of a sudden I was sober and he had me by the throat with my shirt twisted up and up against my counter and trying to like had had his one hand like always by my face threatening to punch me and telling me to stop moving and to and to like let him have sex with me. Reached around and got him in the back a couple times and then I it's it is that's kind of blurry. <laughs> this bizarre story still seems to have more questions than answers. Hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about the Craig Kellaway and Nicholas Raspberry case. This case has got people divided. But not really. Most people are kind of on one side, but there are a few people who do believe Nicholas. So as usual here on my channel, I'm going to give you guys the facts. We'll talk about the theories and then you can decide for yourself. As always, I need to thank my subscribers. Thank you guys so much. So much. And if you are new here, hi. <laughs> this is me. I wear a tinfoil hat and I talk about true crime and conspiracies usually mostly cases where it's both. With all that being said, let's dive in. So the whole thing started on May 4th, 2013. It was a Saturday and Craig met Nicholas for the first time that day. And by the end of the night, Craig would be dead. It actually happened several minutes after this photo was taken. This is the last photo of Craig when he was alive. Craig is the one who's getting his cheek squeezed and Nicholas is the one squeezing the cheeks. This case takes place in Calgary, Canada in a neighborhood known as Auburn Bay. Craig was a middle school teacher and he had recently moved into Auburn Bay. Nicholas, who lived two doors down from Craig, was an engineer in the oil field. And so being that Craig was a new neighbor, Nicholas decided to go over that day. The first day they met was the day everything happened. And so he goes over in the morning and knocks on Craig's door and it's like, you know, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. I'm your neighbor. You know, me and my wife, we live two, two doors down. So Craig was actually gonna have a barbecue that day and his girlfriend, she didn't live with him, but she was gonna visit and come to the barbecue. So he was like, okay, how about you and your wife, the raspberries, why don't you guys come to the barbecue as well? And so they said, okay. And that afternoon, Craig had a barbecue at his house where Nicholas and his wife attended as well as other people and Craig's girlfriend, Lindsay. So they have the barbecue by all accounts, Everything was fine, people, people were drinking, people were eating, and it was all good. Then as the night kind of went on, or the day was turning to night, shall I say, Nicholas invites Craig and his girlfriend, one other couple, to his house, two doors down, for drinks to like carry on the evening. So they say, okay, they kind of go from Craig's place to Nick's place, they continue drinking. And so as the night wore on, Eventually, the couple that wasn't, you know, Craig and his girlfriend and Nick and his wife, they left. And then Nick's wife, she went upstairs to go to sleep. So once that happened, Lindsay, the girlfriend, she was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to leave too. She's like, I'm going to go walk Craig's dog to a nearby park and come crash at Craig's. And so when she left, Craig and Nicholas were alone. And she says they were fine. They were drinking beer and they were talking and it was fine. So she goes, she walks the dog at the nearby park. As she's walking back to Craig's home, she sees ambulance, police. She sees a stretcher with somebody on it coming out of Nick's house. And then she sees Nick arrested. So she freaks out. 
she goes over there and she kind of got upset because the ambulance wasn't going and taking Craig and that's when the officer told her he's dead so the media picked it up the local news was just saying that there was like a death in this Auburn Bay neighborhood and the homeowner was arrested and the cause of death is going to be released soon pending autopsy now keep in mind that this all happened at around 11:30 at night when Lindsay came back and saw the ambulance and the police and all that that was at 11:30 ish later on Lindsay would find a picture on her phone at 10.36 p.m. And that is the picture, the infamous one, which is the last picture of Craig with Nicholas. That was taken at 10.36 p.m. And Lindsay says she doesn't even remember taking the picture. So that should give you an idea of just how much everyone had been drinking because, right, they're day drinking at the barbecue. They go over to Nick's house. They're still drinking. So by this time, by 10.30, 11, they're all trashed. So although Nick and Lindsay's blood alcohol levels were not tested, they did do a toxicology on Craig and they found that his blood alcohol level was six times the legal limit for driving. Along with the toxicology, the autopsy revealed Craig's cause of death and his cause of death was stabbing. Craig was actually stabbed 37 times with three different knives. So it was literally overkill, literally. And as if that wasn't disturbing enough, once the 911 call was released, it was so disturbing. Another one for what city? Hello? Hey, I need the ambulance right now. Okay, are you calling from Calgary? Yes, there's a guy stabbed multiple times by me. Oh my God. Okay, so we do have the paramedics on the way. I need to ask you some questions. Okay, are you with the patient okay. now? Yes, he's right here, but I don't want to go near him. He tried to... Okay, how uh, old is he? I don't know, uh, 30s. Okay, is he awake? Yeah, he's... Is he breathing? Yes, barely. Okay, we do have the paramedics on the way, okay? Okay. All right. When did this happen? Sir, when did this happen? Just like five minutes ago. Okay. Jesus Christ. Okay. okay. Is there any serious bleeding? Yeah, all over, everywhere. All over. Jesus Christ, fuck me, yeah. Okay, what part? I stabbed him everywhere. <laughs> Okay, sir. Is there more than one wound? Yeah, I can stab you multiple times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sir, listen to me very carefully, okay? We have lots of help on the way. I'm talking. It's not going to slow them down. Oh, my God, he's gone. Pardon me? Oh, my God, hurry up. Okay, sir, we do have help already on the way, okay? Now, when help comes, is it going to be safe for us to go in? Yes. Yes, I'm there. I'm opening my front door. Okay. So the 911 call itself is actually 12 minutes long, uh, but we don't have all that audio. I was able to get like a, a clip that was played in court. So here are some quotes that I want to read you uh, from some articles that describe more of what we actually hear in the clip. He immediately says he tried to F me in the ass. Okay. And he says that over and over. He tried to F me. He tried to F me. He tried to have sex with me and I effing killed him for it. So when the paramedic had asked him if he was showing signs of life and stuff, he said that he was making gurgling noises. Then the operator tries to get Nick to help Craig and, and he doesn't want to do it at first. It says, when asked by the 911 dispatcher to help the victim, Raspberry, an engineer in the oil patch, at first refused to do so and kept asking why it was taking so long for paramedics to arrive. Yes, he's, he's like, like not even breathing anymore. I think I killed him. I'm not touching him. I'm not touching him. He tried to F me. That's why I effing killed him. I'm not effing touching him. I'm looking in your mouth. I effing hate you. But how come there's no ambulance here? I live right next to the hospital. They say that Nick was actually vomiting on the 911 call. So I don't know if that's because he was disgusted or he was drunk or probably more likely both. And it says here that um, when they asked him to go and try to help him, he said, quote, will do, even though I effing hate the guy. Near the end of the call, they say that you can hear him kind of talking to the police like as soon as they show up and he says, I didn't do anything wrong, I was attacked. 
So this is going to be Nicholas's defense, right? It's known as the gay panic defense. This gay panic defense is basically like, you know, you panic because you have homophobia, literally like you're afraid of the gay. And so you panic and you want to defend yourself. And so you attack, right? And so that's going to be the crux of this case. Do we a believe that this actually happened? B was this such a threat that it warranted this intense response? You know, that's all going to come into play later on immediately. Craig's girlfriend denied the allegations. She says she strongly rejects Raspberry's statements and she says Raspberry took her boyfriend's life, a math and science teacher, and Carla now she says he's trying to take away his reputation. He was really loved by the community, at least from what people are saying. Now we know that just because you're loved by the community doesn't mean you're innocent and you can't do anything. A lot of these people who do stuff like this are like master manipulators. I'll keep in mind he also had a five month old son from a previous relationship and the mother of his child said no way like he never i never saw any of that in our relationship the, the girlfriend said she never saw any of that and so um and then obviously the parents they were like the most upset it's not over for that raspberry not definitely not over for him it's just, it's just starting we're fighting a battle for our son and we'll keep fighting that battle for our son. Nicholas was arrested at, at the scene. That's what Lindsay saw, Craig's girlfriend. And so soon after that, a day or two, they interviewed him and there are videos. The girlfriend once again took the dog and said she was going home. So it was the three of us, my wife there as well. And then um, my wife went up to bed and we continued, we, we stayed downstairs. And, um, and then at some point I just felt like the night was drawing to a close and I'm not sure if I said I was going to go to bed or if I said I had to take the dogs out to pee, but I kind of remember just kind of making it clear that like the night was kind of over and then uh, it's, it's like just that every, everything changed mood, you know, I was, I was drunk having fun and then all of a sudden I was sober and he had me by the throat with my shirt twisted up and up against my counter and trying to like had had his one hand like always by my face threatening to punch me and telling me to stop moving and to and to like let him have sex with me like I was surprised I'm not a small guy but he was manhandling me and uh, I was ready to just start swinging and then he was started said your wife's upstairs she's next my counter's like this and i'm in the back corner and right beside us and right there's a knife block and i had separation and i grab a knife and i and I, I stabbed him right like reached around and got him in the back a couple times and then i it's it is that's kind of blurry and I, I think at one point either the knife fell or it broke or something. And I remember, I think I grabbed another one and was pushing him away. And we, we made our way into the, into like our, our kitchen is connected to our living room, made our way to the living room. Okay. He fell and it was like, it was over. He fell. I was done. All I remember is putting the knife back on the counter, grabbing my phone and calling 911. And before it was just fists, yeah. you know? And I was prepared to get, you know, get beat up and fight back, you know, and then the, the whole wife thing came into it and, you know, and I grabbed the knife and then at that, that point it's like, it, like I honestly felt like it was him or me, you know, because like I did what I had to do in the situation. <sighs> do, do you think, uh, do, Nick, do you think your reaction was appropriate to what was going on? Yeah, like... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Like beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like I've been going over it a million times in my head and I'm like, what could I have done differently? You know, like could I grab like the coffee makers there? Could I grab the coffee pot? We have a toaster, like what could I have done differently? And like we've got a five five month old baby. And, like, and it's like, you know, my wife's okay and I'm here and I'm happy about that. But I 
I just wish there was something else, that, that, you know? And like, if, if I hadn't been drinking, you know, would I have been able to defuse the situation or, you know? It's just, or would the situation even happen? I just, it's like, my, you know, like, good or bad, I go to jail for the rest of my life or I don't. Doesn't matter, like, I'm from Calgary, like, everyone, everyone's gonna hear about it. Like, and the only way I can explain it is I have to tell people exactly what happened. Now, here is where a lot of people started to doubt Nick's story. They found him to be not telling the truth. They, they, they thought he was lying. Okay, they thought he was lying. They felt like it was kind of fake and that his emotions of the, the feeling sorry was fake. They felt like he was not telling the truth at all. Even the interrogator who was talking to him or the detective who was interviewing him, because that's what they say now is an interview, not an interrogation. Um, she said that she didn't believe it. He, so he, you're doing the holy shit and he's going to beat the shit out of you because you just made a move on him and you, you took the, you did the, you, you took a step because you've been drinking to take that move, to make that move, and it was a mistake. And he reacted, and he's going to beat the shit out of you, and you get scared, or you and you see reds. At the moment, you're you're protecting yourself by making him the aggressor in this, when clearly the scene is going to tell us that you're the aggressor. Like you've stabbed this guy a lot of times, and really scared. Like you've eviscerated him. His bowels are hanging out. Like that's it. Like that's no. huge. Those are huge injuries. Mm -hmm. And I mean, are we gonna find when we go back in that house that you stabbed him in that living room when he's on his back? But but he didn't do anything to you other than hold you by the shirt. What did he do? Trying to have sex with me, threatened to punch me, threatened to but, punch my wife. But how? So he so but he, how did he, he doesn't try to have sex with you, right? You say he doesn't undo his pants. He doesn't undo your pants. He's not grabbing you. He's not doing anything. He's holding you in yet. a hockey, and a hockey jersey. Yet. So we don't know what's going to happen. I know, and that's where I had to. I, and that's where I trust myself, and I trust the person I am. And in that situation, I felt like I did what I had to do because I knew what was going to happen. And it's it's horrible to say, but you know, better him than me and my wife. And also, what what she noticed was that he, Nick, did not have any injuries any scratches, any scrapes, none of that. And so the threat that he had was, you know, talking about him grabbing him by the shirt and pinning him against the wall and, and punching, like not punching him even, but threatening to punch him and telling him that he wants to F him and that he's gonna get his wife next, the one who was upstairs sleeping. This was the threat that Nicholas said made him do what he did and what he did was he said in the interrogation there was a moment of separation that's when he grabbed grabbed a knife and then he started stabbing him he kind of says from the back so i don't know how threatening it is and then that knife broke and then he grabbed another knife he stabbed him some more that knife broke then he grabbed a third one and that was bent so at what point is the threat neutralized and you stop? You know, this is the point of contention, right? People are saying, well, listen, if you're not the aggressor and you're simply attacking someone to defend yourself, usually when the threat has been neutralized, you stop because you're, you're not like the aggressor here. You're defending yourself. What people are saying is maybe what actually happened was the opposite. Maybe he came on to Craig, especially when you look at that last picture, people are saying, you know, he's whooping hands, he's grabbing his face and all that. Maybe he came on to Craig, maybe Craig rejected him harshly, maybe he threatened to tell. And then she also questioned him about why didn't you run? Why don't you like run out the door and ask for help from the other neighbors? And he said, well, I don't want to leave my wife and he then kind of switched gears and made it about his wife. He was like, you know, cause they were kind of the same size and height and build. They were both kind of fit. So it's kind of like, why didn't you just, if he was threatening to punch you, why don't you just beat him up with your hands? Why did it go to this extreme? And so he was saying that, you know, 
once his wife was brought into it, it changed the whole situation. And he was like, it's either him or me. But why did you grab like three different knives even after two broke and then you bent the third one? Like, bro, I don't know. And that's very passionate too, you know, like, I don't know. People were saying that he was worried about himself because he was like, oh my God, you know, my life, I ruined my life. Like the whole neighborhood's gonna know, like, oh my God. And then towards the end, then that seemed like genuine. And then towards the end, he talks about, oh, he has a five month old baby. Like, and the energy isn't the same. According to some people, you know, my conspiracy, I literally don't sue me, but they're like, the fear that he had for himself was more genuine than when he tried to pretend like he cared about the fact that now this five-year-old baby or sorry five month old old baby doesn't have a father speaking of the five month old baby there was actually a little faith in humanity moment that happened this game seems to be lacking intensity you'll have to excuse the athletes they've been playing floor hockey for almost 60 hours straight I hurt in every possible place. 24 players sleeping and eating here since Friday night. One hour on, one hour off. The sore, the tired, the injured. I'm rotating through runners myself so I can move my blisters around a little bit because some hurt my toes and some hurt my heels. And yeah, it's quite an adventure. All for the sake of two goals to make the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest floor hockey game and most importantly a friend of ours had a kind of a tough year last year the father of her baby boy was uh, was killed when he was only five months old and then she got hit by the flood too so figured we'd step up and do a fundraiser for her blake warcop is a year and a half old now and he has no idea they're all playing hockey for him blake was just five months old when his father craig Calloway, was stabbed to death last may yeah it's been a fairly rough year for us for sure we'll get yeah. to him. The community came together to raise money for this little kid and it was kind of like heartwarming and nice and then you know it got depressing all over again per usual. So now the trial begins and nobody's going to be happy at the end of the trial. Both sides are going to appeal at the end and the public is outraged. So this is what happened right? Uh, Nicholas he had some good lawyers and they went with the gay panic defense self-defense their whole approach was he should have never been arrested in the first place our position is uh, we don't even think he should have been charged and the prosecution or as they call them in canada the crown the crown wanted to charge him or they did charge him with second degree murder and they wanted him to obviously do a lot of time so when the trial began you had Nick, who some people, especially Craig's mother, said put on a show where he was being very dramatic. When he saw himself, whether it was the 911 call or whether it was footage of his interview, he would wipe away tears and he would bury his head in his hands. He would, you know, just be very emotional. But when they would describe the gruesome and graphic nature of the attack on Craig, he would be very stoic. And sometimes he would even just close his eyes as they were showing the pictures. And so a lot of people were like, come on. Other people though were like, no, this guy is, is going through it. He didn't want to do this. He was trying to defend himself and his wife. And so, you know, you had more people on Craig's side, but there was still a decent amount of people who felt bad for Nick. As part of the trial, they had the medical examiner come up and in a PowerPoint presentation, he went over every single step okay and it was like when when it was played out like that it seemed so intense and unbelievable and he revealed that not only were a few of them on their own fatal but that some of them were done after the heart stopped beating because there was no blood coming out of them which meant that even after craig was dead nicholas was still stabbing him which means even after Craig was no longer a threat. Nicholas was still stabbing him. And this was a major point. This was the overkill and the what is this really about? And is this really self-defense? Because come on. And then other people were like, no, if you've been attacked or threatened to be attacked that viciously, you would be in a rage and you would go that far. And it's not just for him. It's for his wife and blah, 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 and that whole thing. The other thing was that Nick had no defensive wounds. Not only was he not a punched or attacked or anything, he had no defensive wounds. Not only, but, but there was no actual evidence of Craig trying to 
violate him or take it from him because like his pants weren't unbuckled or buttoned, Nick's pants weren't unbuttoned. There was no actual physical evidence of that. It was just Nick saying that Craig said he was going to do that to him and had him, you know, with his shirt roughed up and his hand was like that. That's, that's what he did. He said, I'm going to do this to you, supposedly, and your wife is next and this, and this made him stab him 37 times with three knives. So I want to read you some descriptions of the, the, the blood that was all around because there was a lot of it and what it sh kind of indicates and what it tells us about maybe what actually happened. So it says here, Constable Jody Arns concluded from her investigation that there were also drip stains on the kitchen floor that were consistent with a person or object contaminated with blood matched to Kellaway, that's Craig, moving around the room. She also found that splatter stains on the kitchen island shelving and on the living room furniture indicate a probable match to Kellaway striking those surfaces. Arn said stains consistent with footwear indicated the wearer of the shoes traveled from the living room into the kitchen and back to the living room. Pools of blood in the living room show a person bleeding, also matched to Kellaway, again, Craig, in the same areas for an undetermined period of time. According to Nick, Nick said that he was hemmed up and pinned in the kitchen, threatened in the kitchen, and he went and grabbed the knives and it happened in the kitchen and all that. But this spatter shows that like Craig was running away from him all over in the kitchen, in the living room and grabbing stuff and falling on stuff. And, and that, you know, there were certain areas where he was just lying there bleeding out. So it just, it seems like he was trying to get away from Nick rather than Nick defending himself from Craig coming towards him. Now I want to talk about the, what the officers testified to in court regarding Nick's wife. Okay. Remember she was, went up to bed and was asleep and slept through the whole thing apparently. And this is what the police said happened when they arrived on scene. So it says the first two police officers to arrive at the scene, constables Cody Bell and Francis Zinn. Zinn said Bell made the arrest and they walked Raspberry out to the police vehicle parked across the street. He said he then returned to clear the house and found the accused's wife sleeping in the upstairs bedroom. Quote, it took a bit to wake her up. She thought it was some kind of joke. We said we were here for a serious incident. She changed clothing. She was a little giddy when talking with us. Both Zinn and Bell said Nicholas Raspberry was cooperative and coherent. He also did not have any difficulty walking or communicating, although Bell said he could smell alcohol on the accused's breath when he spoke. As handcuffs were being placed on him, Raspberry said the victim had tried to S.A. him, Bell told the court. Later, Zinn also recalled Raspberry saying, I got attacked and the victim tried to S.A. him. He said Raspberry told him, I even tried to resuscitate the mother effer. As you can imagine, this case was pretty sensational and there was a lot of online speculation and people were following the case online. That's when a video was dug up. So this video, I want to give a disclaimer. The video was posted 14 years ago on YouTube. So way before this incident happened, this video was up and the video is titled Nick Raspberry Halloween 06. I'm not sure if this is the same Nicholas Raspberry or if Nicholas is even in the video. I mean, Nicholas Raspberry doesn't seem like the most rare name in the world. So it's very likely that this has nothing to do with the case. It's also likely that this has everything to do with the case. So that's my disclaimer. Let me show you the video. <laughs> Did you learn that from your mom? <laughs> oh my dad. You're dead. Oh, oh my god. god. <laughs> Oh my God. 
So the video is posted by a YouTube channel by the name of C Daddy Dubs. They joined in December 27, 2006. So shortly after, you know, like two months after Halloween. And this is the only video that they posted. There's nothing else on the channel. This video was posted December 30th, 2006. So they made their account on the 27th. Three days later, they posted this video. Nothing else was ever posted on the channel. And that was it. Like this channel seems to be created to post this video and nothing else. Again, this happened way before the incident. Let's talk about theories real quick because this video is part of one of the main theories in the case. Because really there are two theories, right? Or maybe three. The first one is what Nick is saying is true. That's what happened. Theory number one. Theory number two is the theory that the officer that was interviewing him proposed and what most people think which is that he came on to Craig and they referenced this video saying that like look this is how they party and maybe you know he was drunk and it was late at night and he was alone and he did something and Craig was not having it and it just like erupted in this crazy situation and they use this video and to kind of like say that okay now the third theory could be that it had nothing to do with gay and coming on to or anything that for whatever reason something else happened that made Nicholas do this. Maybe Nicholas had this in him and he was going to do it anyway. We don't know. But people tend to believe that what you'll do when you're trying to make a story up is you'll kind of do half truths. You'll take the truth but you'll twist it like this really happened but he did it and I didn't do it you know kind of thing. So you believe what you want to believe. Alcohol was obviously a huge factor in this case. Um, you know, they were all drunk. The wife, she slept through the whole thing because she was probably in a drunken slumber. Trust me, I've been there. It's the best sleep ever. And then, you know, the girl, the girlfriend, she doesn't even remember taking the photo. She was drinking. They could smell alcohol on Nick's breath and but he wasn't stumbling and stuff, so maybe he has a high tolerance. And then the blood alcohol level, uh, Craig's blood alcohol level was tested, and that was six times the legal driving limit. And all the witnesses who were at the barbecue and the other couple that was there said that they were drinking all day. So drinking comes up again because after the trial was done, one day before sentencing, Nick gets arrested for DUI. Kind of reminds me of that video I did with the uh, Charlie and Nicole Olsen case. Um, but he does. Let me tell you what happened. It was a Christmas party and Nick was apparently the bartender at this party. And he was, cause he was out on bail. So he was out, he was bartending, his parents were at this party. He was supposed to be the designated driver for his parents. And then he was in um, a checkpoint and he blew not over the legal limit. The legal limit is 0 0.8. He blew between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. Because Nick was out on bail and he wasn't supposed to be drinking and then he got caught drinking, even though he wasn't over the legal limit, he still got arrested for violating the conditions of his bail. A day before he was sentenced. So they took him in, he was in custody, and then the next day was the sentencing. And here's where people get upset because they felt like Nick's family were equating him being arrested with Craig's death as if they were the same when they weren't. Before the judge handed down the sentence, there were victim impact statements for both sides. So you had a lot more victim impact statements for um, Nicholas. He had like nine letters from friends and family that were submitted. And then you had Craig's parents and the girlfriend who had their statements. So I'll just read you what each side said. This is from Craig's dad. The day I laid my son to rest is the day I wish to be buried with him. He was my son and best friend. Then Craig's mom, she talked about how she just is still dealing with trauma and panic attacks and nightmares. She said that she lies awake at night wondering what his last moments could have been and how much he suffered. She said, did he defend himself? Did he beg for his life? My heart is broken into a million pieces. Nick's parents, on the other hand, they said, 
We firmly believe there were two victims that night and we beg of you to be merciful to our son in sentencing. Then Nick's wife spoke out. At this time, she was his ex-wife. She said that the, the stress of the, you know, getting arrested and him being in jail and all this stuff basically ruined their marriage, but that she still considers him her, her best friend. So this is what his wife said, ex-wife. She said, Nick and I weren't just husband and wife. We meant the world to one another. We were best friends. It was the loneliness, heartache, and exhaustion that ended our marriage. The Crown, I don't know, it's not allegedly, that's what they're called. The Crown wanted 15 years for second degree murder. And the defense wanted zero time and that's it. They wanted him to be free. The judge convicted Nick of manslaughter which was the lesser charge and gave him seven years with time served so it was going to be like five years and a few months and people were pissed we are disappointed because i mean i don't understand the justice system it doesn't make sense but then nick was pissed too and he was like no this is self-defense i shouldn't do any time of course we're disappointed in the sentence but we We'll take instructions as to whether we will go to the Court of Appeal. How much um, can you do to protect your wife and yourself from being sodomized? And so both sides appealed. Here is what the judge said about the sentence and why he gave the sentence he gave. He said that Nicholas did not intend to kill Craig. Which honestly, it makes sense, right? Because when you stab someone, 37 times with three knives, you're not trying to kill them at all. You are trying to teach them a lesson. When has a stabbing 37 times ever killed anybody? Never. But he did say that he used crazy excessive force. So I'll read you the quote. He said that he did not view the stabbing as mere self-defense. Raspberry stabbed Kellaway 37 times. In doing so, he broke one knife and had access to another. He broke a second knife and bent a third. It is important that the sentence denounces, denounces the crazy excessive force used by Raspberry in killing Kellaway. The number of stabbings and slashings with the use of three weapons is a substantial aggravating factor in this case. Another aggravating factor is the devastating effect on the Kellaway family. He was of good character and had never been in trouble with the law. It seems to me like maybe the judge believed that this was a self-defense thing and that maybe, you know, he just like went crazy and so it's not really, he didn't intend to do anything, he just went crazy. I don't know. I don't know. But that's what the judge said. If you thought this was bad, it only gets worse. Because they were appealing, Nick's defense attorneys filed for him to get out on bail pending the appeal hearing. And it was granted. Just two months after Nicholas Raspberry was sentenced to seven years in jail for the death of Calgary teacher Craig Kellaway, he's once again been granted bail. For Kellaway's family, it's another devastating blow. What, like, what? I don't understand this. The Alberta Court of Appeal granted Raspberry release while he waits for his appeal to be heard. He's filed appeals for both his manslaughter conviction and his sentence. Well, he wants us all over, so it's, he's not going to be jumping for joy or whatever. He just is focused on coming to a conclusion. Not only was he bailed out, but he had a parole hearing, one of two parole hearings. And in the first parole he hearing, he was granted day parole. Raspberry is working at a Calgary bar. The victim's family watches his social media posts with disdain. Scale of one to ten? I'm way past 10. My son is gone. And he's out there and he's enjoying himself. And then a few months after he got day parole, he got full parole. Okay. There were some conditions. They said that he can't consume alcohol or drugs. He has to receive counseling for substance abuse and violence. He has to report any intimate relationships or friendships with a parole officer, which I found to be interesting. And he can't have any contact with Craig's family. 
The parole board then said that they reviewed both victim impact statements from Kellaway's family, along with letters of support from people close to Raspberry. Since being granted day parole in the spring, they said that he, Nick, has started working with a friend's company. Then he got a full-time job, again, engineering in the oil fields. They wrote that he has been able to spend time with family and a network of positive supports while following COVID-19 restrictions. They said that he also completed a reintegration and life skills program. He had one-on-one -on -one bi-weekly sessions with a counselor where he was described as stable and able to demonstrate that he has, quote, appropriate skills in dealing with stress. As you can imagine, Craig's mom just, she was disgusted. You can feel that they don't have any closure and then their son's reputation has been tarnished and then there's this baby boy that doesn't have his father. He doesn't even know him, five months old, like he doesn't remember his dad. Just the whole thing was pretty tragic. This parole happened December 2020, so you know, several months ago. That's the latest on this case. Nick is free. I would love to know what you guys think about this case. Do you think that Nick was telling the truth? Do you think Nick was lying? What do you think about the sentence? Was it too light? Was it just right? Bars? <laughs> Not funny. He only did like, what, two two years maybe? Two, three years? For, for, for I mean, he, he used as many knives as the years that he got. Three. It depends on, you know, what you think. So again, let me know what you think. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.